Wonderful to see you all. Uh, I must tell you, I, you said very generous things about my involvement with ADA University. However, you should know that our little institute was shaped and extended to the Caucasus under the direct influence of, of, of Ambassador Pashayev. So he invented our institute, you could say. Now, this book, 700 pages, you have to ask, why would anyone write a book 700 pages? It's dangerous. If you drop it on your foot, you could, you could break a bone. Uh, maybe a book that long, the only purpose is to be to, as a kind of medicine against insomnia. That anyone who reads a book 700 pages long will never have insomnia. You know, sleep like a baby. So why did I do this? And let, let me explain, because I think it, since you're all in the same position I was in, studying something new, uh, it may, may be of interest. And here's what happened, basically. I would not claim to be a great expert on Central Asia, of even less on the Caucasus. But I was interested, and I, I, I understood that some remarkable things happened basically a thousand years ago in what you might call greater Central Asia, of course including Afghanistan, and of course including Xinjiang and China, of course including the easternmost corner of, of Iran, uh, Khurasan, here. That in this area some remarkable things occurred. And I, I learned more and more what these were. I'm not going to go into them in detail because I do talk about them in the, in the book at length. And, but let me give you a kind of a taste of it. To, to, to talk about, for example, in, in a field that may not particularly be your main concern in mathematics. Uh, you know that your computer functions because of algorithms. Do you know where the word comes from? They're at the western part of of Uzbekistan is called Khwarazm in, in, in Uzbek or in Arabic. In Russian they called it Khwarazm, which is wrong, but Khwarazm, if you're a guy from there, 1100 years ago, wrote a book with the title Algebra. This gave the name to the field of algebra. And in this he, he brought together everything known about al algebra from the Greeks in antiquity, and Greek science was breathtaking, interesting, I've learned. But he also added many practical things and transformed this whole field of knowledge. He published it in a book called, called, Al called Algebra. And therefore, he signed it with his name, al Khwarezmi, from Khwarezm. And this book was eventually translated into Latin, and he was considered one of the great mathematicians of all times. And so in, the, in Europe, they called him, uh, 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 they didn't call it, anyone who was a real master mathematician, they said, oh, he's an algorithmus. And the word algorithm is a kind of salute to this Central Asian of a thousand years ago. Uh, let me give other examples. Astronomy. Well, one of, one of my Central Asian friends uh, measured the Earth in about ni 900 AD. He was from the Fergana Valley, which is Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan. And he measured the Earth really quite well. He did a good job. And, but 500 years later, Columbus was trying to raise money for his trip west. He, he needed to buy the ships. You know, and, the, and so he went to a group of investors and said, said, guys, I've calculated it this way. If I go west, I have this guy, Fargani, who wrote this book, and, the, and it includes measurement of the diameter of the earth. And so I know the circumference, and I know if I sail west for a mere six weeks, I will reach India. 
They said, oh, that's great. We thought it was much bigger than that. No one thought it was flat, by the way. And they thought, we thought it was much bigger. If it's that short a trip, that's pretty safe investment. Here's the money. So he gets the, buys the ships, goes sailing west, and he gets six weeks later, by gosh, there is land. He said, oh, we must be in India. These are Indians. That's why we call them Indians in, 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 in the Americas. Now, what was wrong? When Columbus read this book by Fargani, he thought that Fargani was using Roman miles. He was, in fact, using Arabic miles, and therefore, he was off by about a third. If he, did he make an intentional mistake or not? We don't know. But Fargani, this forgotten astronomer, was the key guy. Or another thing. Let me tell you about the greatest scientist between antiquity, especially Greeks and Romans, the greatest scientist between them and the modern world was a man named Biruni. Biruni is from, he lived his life in what is now Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Afghanistan. Biruni, well, in 1025 AD, he collected all the data he had assembled. He had measured the Earth even more accurately than Fargani, actually more accurately than anyone until the 17th century, measured the Earth. He then built a globe. And with this, he had also collected all the longitude and latitude known, and he had added hundreds of his own. Greeks knew how to measure longitude and latitude, but he brought that all together, and every place where he knew the longitude and latitude, he'd put a pin on the globe, big globe. And he looked and said, wait a minute. He said that from the western tip of Europe and of Africa to the eastern tip of China and Japan, that's only what, per what percentage of the world? Guess. Half? No, two-fifths. So three-fifths of the world, what's out? He asked, what's out there? <laughs> it's, very, it's a simple question. And then he asked, well, now, how would we answer this? He said, maybe it is water, all water. That's what Aristotle thought. If that's the case, though, being he also, these, right, these thinkers of this era that I'm talking about were big on logic. He said, if that's the case, we need an explanation, a hypothesis of why natural forces would create Eurasia here and three-fifths of the globe would be water. He said, we don't have a hypothesis that would explain it. He said, that being the case, logically, we must accept for now the hypothesis that there is one or more landmass or continents out there. He then moved on and he said, hmm, now are these inhabited? Now he collected all his data on latitude. Latitude is north versus south, you know. And he notice that the northernmost data he had from up here in Scandinavia or somewhere or some, what is now Russia, he said from up there down to the southernmost that we have, it's down here somewhere in southern India, Africa, he said all the area in between is inhabitable and inhabited. Now he then concluded again being rational he said, now, if there are land masses out there in the Atlantic and Pacific, they didn't, he didn't call them that, they would have, if they are uninhabited, uninhabitable, they would have to be north of here or south of here. And he said, we cannot, we have no hypothesis that would explain why nature would create this land mass here, more or less in the middle, and push these other continents way to the north or way to the south. He said, we can't explain that. Therefore, the only hypothesis that we can accept for now is that there are 
one or more continents out there and that they are inhabited. 1025 AD. Now this is by, by a guy who never saw an ocean. He used his brain. He made his own instruments. No fancy equipment. I, think of it. This is, he used logic. He used reason. Now this happened in many other fields. Medicine. All the medicine that was known in the European world, in North Africa, the Middle East, was basically that which was drawn together in Central Asia from all sides and codified. So you have Ibn Sina again in the 11th century, a guy whose family was from Afghanistan. He was raised in what is now Uzbekistan. He then, Ibn Sina creates a canon of medicine, which it was translated into Latin, every medical school in Europe, in the Middle East, and in India, because they tr went, it went east too, uh, was built around his research. Now, I'm not going to take you through every field. There are fields of technology, invention of crucible steel, for example. There are, there are fields of, uh, of uh, windmills came out. You know, windmills in Holland, windmills in China, they all came from from this invention in Central, Central Asia. But the most important that I want to mention is irrigation. You know irrigation. Irrigation is, forces people to use their brains because you're moving water around. You, it's a precious resource. These are oases that this was all that these people came from. And the oasis they might have a thousand in one city we know, 10,000 people working on the hyd uh, hydraulic system. That means you have to be able to measure the flow of water, the measurements of area, everything. It, it, that's why al Khwarezmi did his algebra. So you have the, you have the, they were the best irrigate, irrigation people in the world. It's very important to why they happened. And I'm not going into other fields, but I'm going to this telegraphically say that in literature, in religion, you name it, uh, architecture, art, these people were the world leader. Don't talk about influence of China or India or Middle East or Europe. They influenced all of them far more than any of them influenced this greater Central Asia. So it, where did this come from? Why did this happen? I mean, I could, we can talk for all day about their other achievements. Well, I barely touched the surface. But you have to ask, why does it happen? Why suddenly do human beings in many fields start inventing amazing things or discovering amazing things? Or conversely, why is it that many human beings, even if they have a lot of money, discover nothing, invent nothing. Look at, look at the Middle East today. They have, in parts of it, they have huge resources and yet no patents, no, no major international inventions. Now, what's, going, what, what, what's going on in one place but not in another? What, is it something in the water? What causes it? Now let me say this is one of the two great, three great questions of my book. First, what did they achieve in every area? Second, why did they achieve it? And third, what happened to it? Now, let me focus on the second question. Why did this happen? And think about it. You, you come from many countries. You know, each of your countries is trying to do things that will release talent, release creativity, energy. Uh, some will succeed, but not all. What's the secret? Now let me say, first of all, this is very important. Look at the location, real estate. Here, we're ta here is the region we're talking about. Ah, boy, this is pretty good. <laughs> here, here is the region, reason, re whoa. <laughs> here is the re region we're talking about. If you look at it in the... Yes, if you look at it in the globe, in terms of the globe as a whole, uh, 
if you look at it in terms of the globe as a whole, uh, it's okay. Uh, you will see. Ah, there we go. You will see that this area. Think of the great cultural zone. You have India here. You need to know something about mathematics. You need to credit, finance, all these things have to be worked out. They worked them out long before the Islamic in, uh, invasion from the Arab invasion from the West. They were trading with the whole world. And they were also currency. They were printing coins. Coins that were exported everywhere, used as a, as a medium of exchange. So you find coins that come from this region. You, you find them in Sweden. You find them in Sri Lanka. They were accepted mediums of exchange. So th and to do that, that means you have some sophistication in economics. So these are among the things that trade did. But trade is only part of it, because then there's the contact produces, it brings ideas. Now, half of the countries of the world today are, for one reason or another, closed to ideas from outside, or want to be closed to ideas from the outside. These people weren't. So you have remarkable things. Where did our number system come from? What do we call them? It wasn't Arabic. You know how it happened? The numbers that we use, as opposed to Roman numerals, were in fact invented in India. I, even if you weren't here, I'd say this. They were invented in India. The concept of zero was invented in India. The negative numbers invented in India. How did they get to the Arab world? Very simple, through Central Asia. They didn't go by boat. Actually, we know how they went. If you could go back to the... We know they went from India, not this way. They went from India up this way through northern Central Asia, through northern Central Asia, through Khwarezm. They went through, the, 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 the people who knew this brought these ideas through Afghanistan. They got to the Oxus River on the north of Afghanistan. Right at this point from India, they got on boats. The boats took them all the way up here to the Aral Sea. That's Khwarezm. You, so Khwarezm became the transit point for number systems back into the Middle East. The, some Arab uh, and, the, and the people who wrote about it were from Harazm, for, were from Central Asia. They wrote about it in Arab, Arabic, because that was like Latin then. And therefore, Europeans call, oh, these are Arabic numbers. Mistake. OK, you see how this works. The, we're trying to explain why this happened. Now there's another factor, a very important No place in the world has a richer or more diverse collection of re religions than Central Asia, this greater Central Asia. Now, every religion wants to say, oh, we're all believers. We all think alike. For some reason, that never worked in this region. There, and so you had, before the Arab invasion, you had, this was the center of Zoroastrianism. Zoroaster came from this region. Zoroaster came up with the first, first is the idea of a religion of salvation. He first come up with the idea of, of heaven. The word heaven, paradise. Paradise is Persian. Are there any Iranian Persian Farsi speakers here? What is a garden? There. Louder. Sorry. Louder. What is a garden? Yeah. Paradis. It is a it is the Persian word for garden. It is a Central Asian, if you will, from Zoroaster. Heaven, hell, uh, salvation. The these were all part of Zoroastrianism. 
Zoroastrians ruled in, 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 in parts of the Middle East when the Jewish people went to, uh, were exiled to, to the Middle East, to Babylon, they met Zoroastrians. It, it influenced Judaism in, in these specific ways. Judaism in turn passed these ideas on to Christianity, which in turn passed them on to Islam. Extraordinary. The home base for that is Central Asia. Now, beyond that, you had then, on that base, you had Greeks coming in, Alexander the Great, finding, founding nine cities out there. The Greeks brought the Greek gods. And I can take you tomorrow to a Greek temple in the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. I can take you to a Greek city in the north of Afghanistan with a, with a Greek theater. You know, it's amazing, all this. So they brought their gods, and local people said, oh, I like them, I'll, I'll become an a, a, a adherent of Apollo, or whoever. And then come, then come many others, then come Jews, and we, the, we a lot of information, Jews came to this region very early, Christians of several types, especially, especially, uh, especially those from uh, Syria, Syrian Christianity went deep into China. Then you had Manichaeans and so on. They were all living together. I can take you to cities where temples, churches, uh, of mosques of all, the, or all these are on, on the same street. Tolerance. So these are the things that, were, that, were, that gave this a complex intellectual environment. And so, these people developed something very interesting. They became, they loved to edit these texts. You know, you see all these different religions who hold, you compare them. And so, Buddhism, which started out here, ended up coming up into Afghanistan and Central Asia, all over Central Asia, it was the chief religion. And then, there, local people edited the and translated the Buddhist texts, and that's how they got to China, that's how they got to Japan, that's how they got to Korea, through Central Asia. And how many of you recall the, uh, the statues of Buddha? You know? Always with nice long robe and, and, and nice folds. This is Greek sculpture. Greek sculpture from Central Asia defined the image of Buddha. Why do I mention this? This editing work after the Arab conquest and when Islam began to center here, you, you, it was these people who edited the texts, who gathered, for example, the hadiths of, of Muhammad. Most of the great collections of hadiths of Muhammad were done by Central Asians. Why? Because we've done this before. This is what we did for the Buddhists. This is what we do. And so you, Bukhari, Imam Bukhari, who is the, who, whose collection of hadiths is the second most holy book in Islam, it's of course how it happened. Or give another example, Sufism, the, the mystical trend of, 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 uh, of Islam. Where did it first appear? Well, in many places, but among the first manifestations was on the border of what is now Afghanistan and Uz Uzbekistan at a place called Termez. There, there were, there were 11 Buddhist monasteries. Just the other day, I visited the tomb of, of, of the great early Sufi Hakim al-Termizi. And Termizi, in the ninth century, if you see where did he live and where was his tomb, 30 meters away are a series of Buddhist caves. It was the most natural thing in the world for Buddhist mysticism and the mysticism from Christianity and Judaism to be combined on this spot. These are just Examples, I could give you hundreds, but how culture works, how ideas work. Now, let me, 
conclude by raising a very, very serious question. Why did this end? That various theories, some people say, ah, the Mongols did it. They didn't. It was over before the Mongols. Others say, oh, those Portuguese, Vasco da Gama. He figures out how to sail all the way around here to, here to China and the East without going through Central Asia. Well, it was over long before that. And anyway, the reason they were looking to sail was that the stupid local rulers were charging high tariffs and they were offering no security and therefore the people doing the transport industry said this is crazy let's not let's go find a better route so that isn't the cause there are various theories there are economic theories psychological cultural the water blah 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 i think the most important is that by the end of the 11th century this region was becoming uniformly Muslim. And as that happened, the intra-Muslim conflict got sharper and sharper, especially the Sunni-Shia conflict. And the key figure, it seems to me, is an extraordinary man. I'd like to share, talk about him in detail, but we don't have time. Ghazali. Now, Ghazali was, wrote books on faith later in his life, which are wonderful, had a great impact in Christian Europe, and should have any great impact in the Muslim world. But when he was young, when he was an assistant professor, when he, when he, he, he was very aggressive. And his specialty as a young academic was attacking reason. He said, look, the only thing that counts is faith. Get off your reason. This isn't going to solve any of the big problems in life. It can solve practical day-to-day -day problems like al Khwarezmi with his algebra. It's not going to solve the big problems. And he attacked the, those who advocated the use of reason, those who advocated the use of logic. And he said, forget it. The only thing that counts is faith. He did this in a very brutal way rough way. And as a result, he created an atmosphere in which the free exercise of ideas, like Biruni, like Fergani, like, like all these geniuses I'm talking about, Ibn Sina, it became impossible. In fact, Ibn Sina, the, the great medical guy, and also a great theologian, he was the particular object of attack. Now look, in ending, let, let me say, maybe it's not important how it ended. Maybe all this that I've just said is, should be dismissed. Okay, it ended. We know that. But after all, it went on for 400 years, 500 years. That's pretty good. What modern civilization anywhere in the world can claim to have come up with brilliant ideas, earth-shaking inventions and insights, beautiful art, over four or five hundred years. So my conclusion, and I hope your conclusion, is let's not worry about how it ended. Let's praise what they achieved. Now, final note. In your world today, post-Soviet space, as they say, you have people in Central Asia and Azerbaijan certainly as a kind of an extension of Central Asia and, and, and parts of Iran also, you have people asking, well, I'm no longer content with just ice being isolated as a Tajik. I, I want a Tajik state, but I want to deal with everyone now. And I want an Uzbek state, but I want it, we need to link arms. We have common interests. On what basis do we do that? Very interesting. You can't do it on the basis of religion. There are too many different conflicts in that area. Can you do it on, although some want, would try. Can you do it on the basis of ethnicity? No, there are too many different ethnic groups, sub-ethnic groups. Can you do it on the basis of language? No, same problem. Maybe this shared great history of this noble past 
great minds, great culture, great civilization. Maybe it's time to start looking at that as the basis for identifying your common interests. That's actually happening. And I would like finally to recommend to you that you pay some attention to all this, learn about this forgotten world, and, and maybe you'll find useful things for your own life and for your own times from it. A little longer than planned, but I hope you don't do that. This is great. And I also want to say that Dr. Stark writes and publishes a lot about modern-day Central Asia, modern-day geopolitics of the region. So I'm sure that students are usually more interested in current geopolitics than in you know, 500 year history. So if you have questions about what's happening in uh, the Central Asian region, why the Central today, feel free to ask. Right? Or if sure. No, 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 no. Okay. Go. Good. So, thank you. And uh, now it's time for, we have 20 minutes for questions and answers. Um, please raise your hand and introduce yourself. And uh, if you have comments, that's also fine. So. Or corrections. <coughs> corrections. Actually, there are a few people from the region here. As you know, we have students from Afghanistan, yeah, yeah, from yeah, Kyrgyzstan, yeah. from uh, Turkmenistan. Yeah. So they might actually find some Good. Corrections in your presentation. Go okay. for it. Any questions or comments? Yes. Dr. S Thomas oh. Schultz, um, this is a question and a comment. Uluk Beg is died in what year? He died. Uluk Beg is the grandson of Tamerlane. Uluk Beg was ruled all of Central Asia. He didn't like his job. He wasn't very good at it. But what he really loved was astronomy. And he had a big budget. So he bought the best astronomers, built the biggest equipment, and did a chart of the skies that is, was, until the 17th century, the best. Early 15th century, he wrote. My I had a professor by the name of David King, who was Mr. Astrolabe and all these yeah, sorts of yeah. things. And his theory that he gave me when I was a student your age was that the reason of, for the decline of Islamic civilization, specifically from Central Asia, was because through mathematics and through Ulf Beg's observatory, they finally figured out, the Muslims, how to get the Qibla, or direction of Mecca, from any place on earth. And after that, the ulama said, we have found the answer. We have no more need of science. I don't, I don't think that's what happened. Uh, I, uh, they, they did do that. But, but I think what happened was different. That the, you had finally attention. What, on what do you base your principles and ideas? And, and, and your actions on a day-to-day -day basis. Every day you're presented with choices, right? We all are. On what do you base these? Now, my impression is that due to these conflicts that existed, you had basically two schools of thought. One said that it is possible to find in Holy Scripture in the Quran, in, in the Hadith, answers to all questions of life. If you just have to look hard. And, and th this is the guide to everything. And therefore, this incredible work that went into the collection, publication of Hadith, by the way, it was a battle zone. These were highly competitive people, very bright. Very competitive. Is this one authentic? Is this one? So that was one group. They were, this was a kind of orthodoxy that wanted to base everything on written texts. The other group wasn't a group. It was a wave that went from narrow to wide. Uh, the, some of the other groups said, well, that's fine, do that, but there must be room for interpretation. 
all questions weren't answered. And, and therefore, you have to, we have to have wise people today who can be a bridge between holy text and, and this is, of course, in Christianity, the same debate occurs. It, it continued to be the Shia. They said, yes, there must be room for interpretation, and it, but only certain people who are in the direct descent from the prophet should do that interpreting. But then it went on from there to people who said, no, forget about the text. Use reason for everything. Use logic for everything. So you have a band, I think, and what happened is that the center of this band by the 12th century moved toward the Orthodox who wanted a, a answers, written answers in the text for everything. That gradually suppressed the other side of the band. Something like that. Any other? Yes, please. Well, first of all, you live in a post-colonial world. Post-colonial new countries are very protective of their sovereignty. They're, they should be. I mean, Azerbaijan was sovereign for three years, was it? Two years after, after the wor First World War. In fact, sovereignty for Azerbaijan, for Georgia, is new. And obvious, it's natural that new sovereignties want to protect this treasure. The United States was the first post-colonial country. Forty years after our revolution, there was a guy at my university, Yale, who, who had a table, a round table, with, with a big hole in the middle. And on this table, he put all the words in the English language with his notes. And he would walk around. He eventually published a dictionary of the American language. Not the English language, the American language. Just like people in Central Asia, the Caucasus today, are busy saying, we are us. But then today, now that people are more confident, Look out the window. There's reason to be more confident. People are, are reaching out, and, and, and they're trying to decide what's the basis for our interaction. This is not integration. That's Putin language. This is collaboration. This is cooperation. And it seems to me, though, yes, I know the Turks were saying we're all a big Turkish family, except there happened to be inconveniently some Persians there and some other non-Turks there. How do they fit in? Everyone has their own formula. The only one I would submit that will really work is this one. And suddenly, in the last year or so, there is a huge interest in the subject that is in this book and that I've been speaking about, because this was not forgotten, but, but pushed aside in Soviet times. So maybe a, con you know, it's maybe a usable past is something very valuable. And if that past is a great one, as it is for this region, a, a, a brilliant past, it's even more valuable as a link. I'm optimistic about it. Yeah, yeah. China's got Xi, uh, the, the Chinese nationals, the Han nationals. The, the yeah, yeah, the Japan and so on, yeah. India elected uh, a nationalist leader. Um, I can go on and on. And I, my fear is that these nationalisms, these resurgence of nationalism, are going to spawn smaller nationals, nationalisms as well, within like uh, Xinjiang, maybe the Chechens might uh, be involved again. So I think like, how do you, how do you see this playing in? Like, is this a, a right direction? 
Look, I was just at a conference in, in Samarkand. 300 people from 40 countries came to discuss this stuff. Why did they do it? Because they're saying, you know, this is, these, these old guys were pretty good. You know? we, we may live in different countries, but we can both respect them. And we both, we, we don't know, is this guy a Persian, is he a Turk, is he a Muslim, is he a, a, a Buddhist? Is, you know, yes, these differences exist, we understand, but their achievement is an aspiration. Seeing everyone in the audience, they were like this, they were, they were engaged. So I, I think on a regional basis, may, yes, there is nationalism, and this isn't against nationalism. It is just saying, are you going to build a second story on the house or not? Yes, please. Well, now let me, let me answer this question about the future of this region by focusing on, on the most difficult, most backward, most problematic country in Central Asia, and that's Afghanistan. And by the way, I hope I convinced you earlier that the old Soviet division that there's Central Asia and Afghanistan is something else doesn't work. Uh, Okay, I, let me just say about Afghanistan, because if it can somehow turn a corner and do well, who can't then? Now, let me ask you to do this. Compare the prospects of Afghanistan today with the prospects for South Korea in 1955. Now, I mean, this is a nice little problem to sit and, you know, speculate on. You don't need to read books, just think about it. South Korea, 1955. Did it have a strong national borders, clear identity as a state? No. No one had ever heard of a South Korea. Did it have a capital? No. Uh, it, 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 had, it had a a few cities here and there, but it wasn't clear who, where the capital would. But did it have, did it have uh, resources? No, still doesn't. Natural resources. Does it have, did it have um, an intelligentsia? No. Worse than that, if you'd asked, done a survey around the world and asked, what about Koreans as workers? You, the answer would have been, well, do they work? They're pretty lazy, I think. It would have been a, quite a negative picture. Uh, do they have a rising generation of talented people, educated, talented, worldly people? In 1955, not really. You ask the same questions of, and, uh, of Afghanistan. They have a state since the 18th century. Over 30 years of invasion, civil war, fighting of every kind, nobody asked to leave. No part of Afghanistan said, we want to go and be separate. No one did. They argue over control within Afghanistan, but they don't. Their identity is strong. Furthermore, no one doubts that Kabul is the capital, and certain arrangements are understood. Beyond that, resources. Read the U.S. government's report on resources in Afghanistan that came out a couple of years ago. It is spectacular. It, there was a Soviet study 30 years ago when they were occupying the country. Those guys must have been drinking too much vodka because they missed two-thirds of what's there. It's an amazingly rich country in resources. And then finally, intelligentsia. Uh, Mr. Rahimi is here. Where are you? <laughs> I don't mean to embarrass you. <laughs> but but, uh, but in, 
Rahimi's generation are thousands of young people who are really good. They have a big view of the world, they know languages, they're smart. No one like this was available in Korea in 1955. And Korea had, admittedly, very strong and steady support for the United, from the United States. We'll see if, if Afghanistan has strong and steady support from anyone. Now, we'll see. If we're not sure. I think, I think they will. My conclusion, and your serious question, is that everyone spending their, all their time worrying about disaster in Afghanistan, maybe it's time to think alternatively about the possibility of a tremendous success. Now, I, I'm an analyst, and you're in your academic work asked to analyze things soberly and clearly. You have to consider all possibilities. And one of the possibilities of Af in Afghanistan is a real success. If that happens, and you are sitting around planning only for disaster, you will miss the boat. And your, co uh, your company will miss the boat, your country will miss the boat. It'll all happen without you. But a follow-up question to this about Putin, more specifically about uh, Putin's assert assertive policies in post-Soviet space. Do you see a risk for restoration of some some way, I mean, Central Asia has, has, is already yep. under Russian pressure. So can it work? Yeah, can it work about Putin? Now look, there's been a lot of psychoanalysis going on on poor Mr. Putin. Uh, I, I read in all around the world, and especially the Russians themselves, uh, one of them writes, well, you know, uh, uh, Putin uh, has a kind of, uh, he grew up in this terrible neighborhood of Petersburg, and he spent all his time fighting everything nash-vash, our guys, your guys. You know, that's the problem. And another says, well, no, Putin's problem is actually worse. He uh, ha has a KGB background, which is true. And a third says, well, no, that's not it. God made him too short. <laughs> and notice that when he needed to find someone to fill his seat, he found the only guy, I knew both of them, I worked with both of them in Petersburg when, when they worked in Subchak's office there. He found the only guy who was shorter than him, Medvedev. So there are, all the, <laughs> there are all these theories. I think they're totally uninteresting. I, you can say what is his method, and you, there you can have complete clarity. It is to p fill geopolitical vacuum. When he perceives that there is a geopolitical vacuum, look, he has a kind of pachmiel. <laughs> it's a kind of pachmiel sovietsky imperi. And every time a person with this pachmiel sees a political vacuum, <laughs> sees a political vacuum, a geopolitical vacuum, he'll move to fill it. So the question isn't about Putin, it's about the conditions that create a vacuum or not. And that's, that gives you an analytic perspective to talk about every country in the Caucasus, Eastern Europe, the Baltic, and Central Asia. Now, will it work? In the end, absolutely not. Empires do not get recreated. The one exception was Trotsky, who rebuilt the Tsarist Empire, but he had the Red Army behind him. And it was willing to do everything necessary to reconstruct the empire. I don't think there is a chance in the world that this will succeed. Um, I won't emphasize the demography. But Russia is still in a demographic collapse. Ever, and furthermore, Putin's own actions have, look at the situation, look, at, look on Chechen TV. This is directly under the president's office in Moscow, and you'd think you're looking at Saudi Arabia TV today. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, look, I mean, he has, mobile, he has done what, what people couldn't do for 
75 years, and that has mobilized the Tatars, the whole, the whole Volga Basin. There are so many concerns. I mean, the, the collapse of, of Russian science. Uh, they, they, back to patents, they've, they have, they have uh, gotten fewer patents than, than Austria in the last 30 years. And Austria is, is a, you know, tenth the size. Uh, the, how many world businesses are based there? Only Gazprom. I mean, you know, they, here is a, here is a culture uh, with, with a tradition of education, technological skill, and so on. Nothing's working. Now, does that, can you expand it and make it m magically work? I don't think so. The question is not whether in the long run this will succeed or fail, because it'll fail. The question is how much damage will be done in the short run, in the midterm. And it seems to me, if my hypothesis, and I'm like Biruni, I'm not saying this is the only reality, I'm saying it's a hypothesis. If the hypothesis of filling geopolitical space is correct, then the future is, has, comes as much from your action in Azerbaijan and all the other countries and the actions of the major powers, including my own country, the United States, including Europe, including China, including India, uh, as it does from Russia itself. Those vacuums should be reduced quickly and effectively. At that point, he will have no opportunities. Good. Uh, I will take one last question. From where? Pakistan. Where? Uh, oh. I suspect you're writing a PhD on this and know a lot about, more about it than I do. Um, uh, obviously, politics can become the focus of differences. But um, let me go back to my story here. I, I really think that this story has enormous importance for the contemporary world. Um, Pakistan. Pakistan, you could make this argument for Pakistan. Many have. I was there a few months ago. The, where is Pakistan? Pakistan is right here. Now look, where, look at your geographical location. It, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. It, Pakistan is the Indus Valley. If you take 3,000 years, don't look just at yesterday's newspapers. You, you spend too much time on that. Look 3,000 years and you say, wait a minute, the Indus Valley is the center. It's the inevitable natural trade center of all Eurasia. Now, for various reasons, and you know them better than I, both the eastern and western border of Pakistan have been nearly closed. So you can say politics has destroyed the greatest asset that Pakistan has, which is geography. Now, but people are smart. And your fellow Pakistanis are smart, too. They know that the windows have to be open. And so whatever your argument may be on a political level with India, or on a cultural level, or on a religious level with India, there is now $10 billion of trade going across that border. It still isn't open, but practical people are, are studying this deep history and saying, wait a minute, we're, is it really worth it to lose all this because of bad politics? And on the West, you have signed a 
trade and transit agreement with Afghanistan. It's a wonderful agreement. I know the Afghan guys and the Americans who worked with them on this. It's a wonderful agreement. It's just not being implemented. It will be. When that happens, let me put it this way, century. Nobody in the past called it the Silk Road because it wasn't a Silk Road. It, it, it was a two-way commerce in everything. And as I hope I indicated, the Central Asians influenced, sent as much out as they got in. Now, the Silk Road from China to Europe was not that old. It started a couple of hundred BC. It was interrupted constantly. Moreover, the Silk Road never was that heavily used and not that many ideas went along. If now talk about something else, the road that goes from India, deep in India, all the way across here to the Caucasus, all the way to Europe across Afghanistan, across Pakistan. This, this is the old, longest, it is the oldest trade route in the world. 2500 BC, the Afghans were exporting lapis lazuli. Do any of you ladies have lapis lazuli jewelry? You should. Beautiful stone, it comes from Afghanistan. And they exported it to ancient Egypt. They exported it to ancient India and to, to, to China, everywhere. This is the lapis lazuli road, the southern road across. Now, why is this not open today? It, 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 it had more traffic. It was never interrupted. It sent more ideas, including your number system, zero, minus numbers, all the... It, than any other route on earth. Why isn't it open? Because of really, frankly, stupid politics. So solve that problem, open that route, open all these routes, open the windows everywhere, and you'll have another episode like they did a thousand years ago, and it will be good for all of us. Thank you. Great. Thank you.